that first edu worship hour. Thank you for your trust and and going along and doing something different that you've never done before. It's absolutely a privilege to be with you. Ten decades, five generations of people gathered to hear about Jesus. Although I've lived in Arizona, in Phoenix, in a 1930s house downtown for 30 years, I grew up in Iowa. So to be here in the fall is absolutely heaven. Thank you for the trees in this beautiful day that was yesterday and today. Now, if you've grown up in the church and participated regularly in worship, then some of you have heard many messages and sermons about the feeding of the 5,000. For others, maybe you're hearing it for the very first time. Or by hearing it now, read to the children from a storybook Bible, you may have heard something in a new way. Maybe an aspect of God's story that caught your attention, like it never has before. As you heard me share just a little, my spouse and I, we love storybook Bibles. My husband collects them. He has more than 30. I love reading from storybook Bibles because sometimes then I get it. It captures my imagination and my heart. The feeding of the 5,000 is a remarkable story. It is found in all four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And in Matthew and Mark, the same or a similar story is told twice. It's a remarkable story because it's God's story. And it is our story, too. It's about me, it's about you, your household, it's about United Lutheran, about this community of Grand Forks, and it's about our denomination that we call the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So why is this such an important story? Because like many other biblical stories, it's a story of a generous God. It demonstrates once again for the crowds, the disciples, and us, Jesus' compassion for the other. It is not a story of fear or scarcity, but about abundance. Now, a bit of background on this story. Jesus had not intended to address the crowds that day. It was not on the website or on the church calendar of events for the week. In fact, Jesus was trying to get away from the crowds. He needed some rest and some quiet time. He had just received news, some bad news about a friend who had died. But the crowds followed him everywhere because they knew of the healings and other miraculous things that Jesus was performing. People in the crowds had heard of his message of love and hope for a more abundant life. We believe that many of those in the crowd were poor, sick, homeless, or they wouldn't have been following Jesus. We also believe that there were more than 5,000. You just heard in the Gospel reading, 5,000 men. Because back then they didn't count the women and the children. So there could have been 10,000, 15,000, or more. As we all know, at the end of a long day of following and listening to Jesus, everyone was hungry. Jesus, out of compassion, turns to the disciples to help solve this situation and feed them. It was not a question of, should we feed them? But, we will feed them. But how? Now, the disciples' solution, as you've heard, was to send the people home or off to the market to fend for themselves. That, of course, was impossible. It was even ridiculous, because there were only a few small villages, and they were some distance away. There were no supermarkets or food trucks, food vendors to feed thousands like we might at the Super Bowl. And most folks in the crowd would have had little or no money. To the disciples' reaction of, this is impossible, we have so little to offer, Jesus simply responds, Share what little you have, and let's see. I think in today's language we call that asset mapping. 
We discover our strengths and our gifts and then match them to the needs of the community or the other. And in the account of the story found in the, bi in the book of John, there's a little boy, a child that gives all he has. Now how often in scripture don't we hear and learn that it is the children among us who lead? We've seen evidence of that this morning. So next, Jesus takes the boy's lunch, blesses it, expresses gratitude to God for what has been given. Jesus doesn't twitch his nose or snap his fingers to feed everyone. It is not magic. Jesus doesn't just go and feed everyone himself. Instead, he issues an invitation. He gives the task to distribute the food to the reluctant but willing disciples. And even if they had doubts, the disciples do as they had been invited. They feed the multitude. They care for the poor, possibly the homeless, and the sick who had gathered. Sounds a lot like God's work Our Hands Sunday that happened here. 75 personal care kits, 1,000 cookies distributed to those who serve and keep your neighborhood safe. And in our story for today, we know the results. There was enough. All ate and were filled full. The disciples took up what was left over 12 baskets full. There was a surplus and abundance. It's another example of the extravagance of our God. Making something out of little, giving us more than enough. Now an important side note is that the action of a kind and generous God, as seen through the compassion of Jesus, was not the predominant story of the time. There were still gods and idols that were worshipped. And these were gods and idols to be feared. They were not merciful and compassionate. They had a reputation for siding with the rich and the powerful. Sometimes these gods were downright mean, unforgiving, and self-serving. This morning, in our education time together, we looked for just a few moments at the predominant story in our culture, in our time. Almost every message in our society is about buying and getting and spending. Our culture and society's narrative is about creating more wants, and almost every advertisement tells us that to be happy, we need more stuff to take care of myself first. Now, much too often, like the disciples, we believe there is not enough. But as a household, or as a congregation, or as a nation, we cannot afford to feed the poor or tend the sick. There are too many times that we say, send them away. Let someone else feed them, tend to them, heal them. Send someone else to walk alongside them if anyone does at all. My spouse and I have the privilege of supporting two young adults in Kenya. These two young adults, her name happens to be Linda as well, and Bernard, call us grandpa and grandmum. I don't have biological grandchildren, but to these two, I am their grandma, their grandmum. We've met them and are part of their adopted family through our son, who has lived in Africa and studied in Africa, and met them when they were orphans and were small children. As they've grown up, he's continued to be their support. But when our son chose to go off to college, he had a midlife transition and work on a master's in Cape Town, South Africa, he was penniless, and we knew that Grandpa and Grandmom had to step up. But my spouse had just retired, and I'm working part-time, and there was that moment we looked at each other, can we really do this? Linda and Bernard have gone so far, and now they're in college too. And then we turned to each other and laughed. We have 51 light bulbs. <laughs> Linda and Bernard each have one. What were we thinking? It's become a phrase. Whenever we have that doubt, can we do this? We say, we have 51 light bulbs. Hmm. Like the little boy, 
We, just ordinary people, are invited to share what we have, to relinquish our hold on whatever God has given us in terms of time, talents, and wealth. And from our contributions of time, talent, and treasures, regardless of how small or how large, God accomplishes extraordinary things. I want to read to you these words from our bishop of the ELCA, Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. Sometimes when we think about our congregations, synods, or households, it is easy to view them through the lens of scarcity. God provides in ways beyond our imagination. In the midst of scarcity, we find abundance. In a world where terror and cruelty proliferate, we discover seeds of hope and love. Lutherans, we Lutherans, we don't withdraw from the world or send people to fend for themselves. As a disciple and member of United Lutheran and the ELCA, you are part of a much larger story of generosity. You are connected to 9,300 congregations, 65 synods, and one church-wide organization. Our church is connected globally to 72 million Lutherans through its membership in the Lutheran World Federation. And now listen to this. If you don't get goosebumps, then goodness. The ELCA reaches more places and more effectively than any one person, one household, one congregation, or one synod could ever do alone. We accompany global companions and churches around the world. We send 200 missionaries to 90 countries. We serve thousands through the partnership with Bread for the World, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. As Lutherans, we are halting the spread of HIV. We are this day, at this moment, responding to Hurricane Matthew, the Louisiana Gulf Coast flooding, Africa drought, West Virginia flooding, Nepal earthquake. Lutheran Social Ministry, in partnership with Lutheran Refugee Services, has welcomed more than 379,000 refugees to the United States since 1939. This congregation and this community has been an integral part of this ministry. It's some of the stories that I've heard of your extraordinary hospitality, your generosity to the stranger among you. Because of your generosity and others like you, the ELCA, in just five years, raised $15 million to help eradicate malaria in 13 countries. You know, I think about that little boy offering his fish and loaves of bread. Can you imagine what he felt? Seeing that 5,000, but we know it was more like 15, being fed with that little bit? Aren't you in awe to know and to wonder how the little bit that each of us offer feeds the world that is present in the world? I get goosebumps at witnessing the sharing among you, the sharing that happens and the wondrous works. Since arriving and learning of the events in this community in April 1997, I know that many of you can also identify with the crowd as you were the recipients of other people's generosity and kindness. You were dramatically reminded of what is truly important in life, that it's not just about stuff. You were brought to new levels of compassion, resolve, and caring for one another. In the Jesus Storybook Bible, and you can come up and look at it later, but the very last page, it says, this isn't the end, as most stories conclude. Instead, it says, this story lives on in you and me. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to a new way of living. We are called to share a better story than the one of an angry and punishing gods of ancient times. We are called to share a better story than the one of our culture that says we need more stuff. We have a story to share of an abundant, generous God who takes the nothing and makes it everything. In a few moments, we will all join together to say the Lord's Prayer. Notice 
When we say that, we do not say, give me this daily bread. We say, give us this day our daily bread. And just as Jesus gave thanks to God before eating, we do the same when we gather at the Lord's table. The bread will be broken, blessed, and thanks. And then all are welcomed. All will be fed. And there will be more than enough. Here we break bread and eat at the Lord's table. In our daily lives, you break bread in many places. Maybe it's McDonald's. Maybe it's at your table. Maybe it's at Starbucks where you gather around the table. But like we've heard in the story and we will practice, I encourage you that if you don't already, take time to just stop and give thanks. Just say, thank you, God, for this food. Just giving that recognition that we didn't bring this to the table all by ourselves. And finally, this morning, when you entered worship, you were given a paper plate. If you didn't receive one, our ushers can pass you out a paper plate. I invite you in just a moment to think about a gift, like the little boy sharing his lunch. What is a gift that you have to share? Maybe it's something you know how to do, like fix car engines or bake cookies. Maybe you're a nurse, knows how to take blood pressure. Maybe it's knowledge you have, or you can play the piano, whatever that gift is. Would you write it down on that plate or draw a picture of it? There's pens and pencils. Raise your hand if you don't have a plate. We'll make sure you get one. And when you come up for communion, when you come up to the table, would you bring that plate with you and place it in the baskets? And I would guess that those baskets are going to overflow, and it's going to land on the floor, and that's okay. And if you do not and are not able to walk forward, then hand your plate, your gift, to someone to bring forward for you. This we offer in the Lord's name. Amen. <clears throat> 